Hello, welcome back to Curiously Polar. I'm Chris, and this is episode um, 148 for February the 17th, 2022. <music> and of course, I'm not alone. I have with me Mario Aquarone. Buongiorno. How yeah. are you? Yeah. Buongiorno. Guten Tag. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm doing. A little bit better now. You're <laughs> slowly, slowly, this, slowly making your way slowly getting back better. to back to the yes, the land of the living. Hey, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. <laughs> yes. No one wants this. Stuff. Thank you. No one wants. I this. mean, now uh, Henry has had it. I've had it, and uh, I I'm, hope that you will skip. <laughs> I'm trying my best to skip it, but um, <laughs> you never know. Yeah. I will travel over the weekend, so let's. Find out. Not in an airplane. Yeah. In Stay a safe, anyways. Yeah. Yeah. Another Poland so, newsreel. Another week, another yeah. newsreel. We have uh, yes. fun stuff today. I'm excited yeah. about this episode. You have an important a lot of stuff, I think, as well. Quite important. Last week, did you know that it was the, the 11th of February was the International Day of Women and Girls in Science? I learned this from you. I didn't know this. <laughs> yes, exactly. So it is. It is a. Um, it is not a uh, a secret or not a not something unexpected. Unfortunately, that women are underrepresented in science, yes. and uh, they were practically excluded from science uh, uh, until very very recently. I would say, in spite of having like big names like Marie Curie, for example, with uh, one of the few persons. Those are the exceptions, the person, right? Having, like two. Two uh, two Nobel prizes and her husband has a Nobel prize and daughter as well. So it's just like there are there are very few exceptions. But we are talking about only about thirty percent of uh, scientists being women, and not only that, but we are also talking about uh, uh, women proportionally getting less funding for research look uh, being awarded less funding for research i mean mm -hmm. funding normally goes through an application procedure so like you, there are calls for applications one writes a, a project and applies for funding and women in general get less money than men so so if you're talking that while women represent 33 percent of all researchers uh, there are also uh only about uh, 12 percent that are members of national science academies um and uh and uh, like uh, in any case like uh, cutting edge uh, research uh, like artificial intelligence is only 22 percent uh, women representation and that and does not correspond course, with uh, with the um, percentage of women in population at all no exactly and and that is uh, that is an indication that there is still a lot of work to be done to help including women and and this is why it's women and girls in science as well because it, it starts early on this uh, this exclusion from from mathematics exclusion from science exclusion it's not just science it's uh, like also the in the academia in 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 research so uh, so that is uh, uh, the the uh, how do you call it the <laughs> the the introduction to to the next uh, to the next or the first uh, article or the first um, thing that we would like to talk about uh, here in uh, in this Polish newsreel and uh, i came about a uh, a an article from from last uh, uh, year about uh, was it march 2021 that uh, is coming from the national science foundation from the homepage of the National Science Foundation, and it's uh, uh, about the first women ever. I mean, they happen to be scientists that came to the South Pole, and um, mean, and that was oh, in oh, 1969. Okay, I was I was just saying this article is from 2021. It can't be that women haven't been to the South no, no, Pole no, no, until no, no, 2021. No, 69. No, 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 no. no. So this is an article from last year, and it reports about the first occasion of when women came to the South Pole or were allowed to get to the South Pole. Because that took that's, a long uh, time. That took an enormous long time, and uh, and it's um, uh, these uh, were six. Uh, well, actually, there were four researchers, uh, five researchers, and a um, 
a uh, a reporter from um, they were mostly from four of them were from the US one from New Zealand and uh, of the scientists and then a reporter from the Detroit Free Press and they arrive at the South Pole for a research so they had uh, they had 10 weeks of research uh, mostly linked to geology in the uh, dry valleys we mentioned in some of the podcasts before and uh, they were uh, really like serendipitous because uh, especially it was uh, Lois Jones um, here in number two from the right in the picture that you are showing that uh, was uh, the one that applied and applied and, and finally got money and permission to go to Antarctica because Antarctica was served in logistics by the Navy and uh, and it was very difficult to go through the application process get the money but also to get the permission to go to antarctica with the uh, with with the navy and uh, there had been uh, also women doing research in antarctica and, and lois jones had actually worked on a phd on some rocks uh, in antarctica but she had to send a man to go and get the samples for a phd for example <laughs> and that, <laughs> and that, that was so uh, that was really ridiculous like, i mean yeah. Ah. yeah and and because she wanted to do a little bit more and you know when you are there you can also take samples in a, in a special way it's difficult to explain especially without direct communication and two ways communication down to antarctica it's difficult to direct like, if, like you have no idea what the th place looks like and you have to make decisions about sampling for example and then she made this application and she got money and there were all also women that had been close to Antarctica and doing research close to Antarctica but never down at the South, South Pole because there were people that participated and that was in 1962 uh, Mary Alice McWhinney that was the first woman to participate in the US Antarctic program of research on an offshore research vessel so she was on board a vessel but she was not allowed to go down on the on Antarctica and fortunately these women they managed to get down and they were airlifted down to mcmurdo and when they arrived they were uh they were like also a media sensation <clears throat> and and um, they were a media sensation already before leaving but uh, if you uh, scroll down a little bit under the black and white picture of the four women there is a fantastic uh, like the second paragraph just below there there is a fantastic questions that an example of of questions that the reporters oh, like yeah. sexist questions that the reporters were actually posing like so for example cool. will you wear lipstick while you work or how will you have your hair done and that uh, was end, and the end of the 60s yeah exactly is... and it's really amazing uh, amazing in a very yeah. negative sense Absolutely. exactly and fortunately fortunately we've come away from this sort of question i hope i mean in in at least in in my world this, these are questions that would make people cringe i mean men and women alone and they would be like there would be a no no question to to talk to to yeah, pose to anybody you, you, still, you still this. see in some media see these questions today when it comes to female politicians and other uh, professions ah. where yeah okay that's yeah, like, like like talking about this with uh, your former chancellor Angela Merkel, I, I I found that it was very weird that somebody was commenting that she had always the same dress on and something like nobody nobody asked any male politician if they have always the same coat and tie or suit on. <laughs> Yeah, are Anyways. you you you've been wearing this tie three times before? Are you? <laughs> yes. So what why? are you going to do about this? Are you living alone? <laughs> yes. And Anyways. where do you get your nails so, done? Exactly. So so this is uh, this is really interesting, and and this is in on the twelfth of November, nineteen sixty-two. So it's. It's like 69, so we are talking, I mean, I mean 50 years ago, or like 60 years ago, uh, and like 50, uh, 53, and uh, it's uh, amazing to think that that is so, such a short time ago, It's but we yeah. still have very few people. Now, the next site that is important that is connected to this is uh, um, a site uh, it's the arctic institute 
um, it's a center for circumpolar uh, security studies so the Arctic uh, Institute and you can go and search for women in polar research and this is a brief history and it's a very short article about women researchers scientists in in, in polar exploration and uh, and there are organizations like uh, there is an organization that is called 500 women scientists there is a movement called women in polar science that has also a facebook and twitter page if you just uh, google that and and plan a is also a very nice uh, a very nice site to visit but uh, in this article here at the arctic institute uh, it is actually condensed uh, bits about the history of exploration because it's not that women have not tried to be part of polar research. Lady Franklin, for example, was instrumental in setting up all the rescue operations for the Franklin Northwest Passage expedition when Franklin didn't come back <laughs> and they realized that there was a problem. If it hadn't been for Lady Franklin, there would not have been any expedition to go and and try and rescue and fin find them. Uh, there was uh, a um, uh, like a Mary Stopes uh, that is uh, one of the birth control advocates that uh, had a request. She was a paleobotanist, and uh, early in the 20th century, she asked to be in Robert Scott's Terra Nova expedition uh, to do field research, which, of course, he duly refused. Shackleton uh, uh, tells of a story about uh, three sporty girls, in quotes, that uh, begged to be included in the Imperial Transatlantic Expedition, the one that we are talking about uh, uh, last time with the uh, uh, endurance. And, uh, uh, and he refused as well. And there were requests to join Mawson, um, from the Australian explorer, uh, Bird, uh, Richard Bird, the aviator, and all sorts of uh, all sorts of women. I mean, there are one thousand three hundred women that applied to join a British Antarctic expedition that was uh, set up in nineteen thirty seven, and they were all denied. Imagine that you have a hundred a thousand three hundred women, and there is no one that passes the screening for and, joining an expedition. And even uh, in, even in existing research, when women where material in that research, they were often not even mentioned or overshadowed by their male peers. Exactly. And and we have, I mean, and these, do you, now we have, I was mostly thinking about women from, let's say, Europe or North America, but, uh, but let's say, uh, from uh, the uh, established societies uh, in, in the big cities and things. But uh, we, are, we are talking a few uh, podcasts ago about Ag Ada Blackjack. I mean, we're talking about yes. Inuit women that joined and were instrumental and they managed to join in the, because of their skills in hunting or living in extreme conditions. So, uh, so there are um, there are uh, quite uh, it's <laughs> there are quite a few examples, but there are only very few about with with women joining early expeditions and expeditions uh, even uh, after World War II. There were some changes, and this is something I want to say as well that uh, in the uh, in the. Uh, ex-Soviet Union, uh, there were actually uh, possibilities for women that were better <laughs> than in other parts of, uh, of the world. And um, there were women in polar research in the Soviet Union in the 30s, at the same time when there were 1,300 women in Britain that were not uh, allowed to join the, the, uh, the expeditions. So there is, there have been a few, uh, a few possibilities uh, in in some parts of the world, but still, uh, there are. I mean, if you take about the first, uh, there is uh, uh, the first uh, female scientist to work in Antarctic uh, by it was in the uh, 
for the International Geophysical Year in 1950. I mean, it was not at the South Pole like our six uh, women down there, but uh, she was uh, Russian. And uh, Australia and France uh, have sent female scientists in the subantarctic in 59 and 61. And in 62, there have been a few, uh, like we mentioned, uh, uh, researchers on, uh, on research vessels. And um, yeah, and uh, well, uh, this is an extremely interesting, at the same time is scary reading about gender inequality. And, and if one thinks that still now there is gender inequality, it is, um, it is a good uh, reminder that there is work to be done. Yes. So and, we're, uh, we're doing our like part a, and, and a, uh, shedding some light on this and uh, helping yeah. it be more visible, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's uh, it's difficult to say what one can do, but uh, directly, especially when one is not uh, directly involved in, in recruitment. But uh, uh, there are hopes. I mean, the Association for Polar Early Career Scientists, which is a, uh, a quite a quite an interesting and big and important organization, it's called APEX. Association of Polar Early Career Scientists has 55% of his members as women. I mean, they are. I mean, so it's uh, yeah. there are there is interest as and there are be. capacities, and uh, and so there is no shortage of women <laughs> that are interested in polar research. It's just how to retain women and uh, how to make the conditions uh, more acceptable for also for for women i would say make them more visible that is one of the first steps in every respect i mean we're 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 looking at um and this is from a very german perspective because um our language is gendered so um there's a difference between a, a t well the default term is usually the male form right if you say mm. a teacher then that is um that's always the main form, the male form, unless you specifically mm. um, qualify it in some way. And there are, there are like, I don't even know, the, the majority of professions have male terms and that makes women more invisible. So, um, but still, if you, if you, I don't know, even in English that doesn't gender, if you say a teacher, a scientist, the picture that yeah. pops up in most people's minds is a man. Yeah. Uh, so you, you 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 kind of have to qualify yeah. woman scientist, female scientist, female teacher. And that is a problem. That's a big problem. Hmm. Yeah. So visibility is I exactly. think one of the keys there, absolutely. Yeah, and uh and visibility, but also publicizing people and, and women that is uh, visibility that have too. Able, yeah. Have been have been able to uh to to attain or there are or have been in uh, in in prominent positions i, I mean, would in, like in germany the alpha vegana institute has had uh, uh, two uh, women as directors i would so i would really is... like to see a project a scientific project that goes back in history and digs out the women that have not been mentioned up to now that have yes. been hidden behind uh, male achievements and who have often achieved the oh, same yes. or more so Oh yes, and uh, and uh, and also the women that have been uh, that have been uh, wronged. Um, oh, there yeah. is uh, one researcher uh, uh, in in Norway that um, she's actually buried here in uh, at the at the cemetery up here in Tromsø. That was so much, let's say, sexualized that. One of the members of the expedition on the ship had written a a, a, a piece where she was the uh, where she was uh, like presented like the seducer, as she most probably wasn't on board. I mean, she was the only woman on board, so it's actually any and in any case, it's not <laughs> like that. You have to assume this, but but she was vilified by this. Uh, account of the uh, of the facts of the expedition, and also that she was uh, she was then accused of wrongdoing. I mean, not only and based on these fantasies, they were mostly like the fantasy of an, of an old, yeah, pervert. 
And here's yeah. two guys discussing this. I think we need women yeah, representation yeah. on this podcast. So uh, we and that, that's also that because like uh, when uh, it's it's in, it's interesting also this. I mean the, we we need also more women accepted in debates and in uh, and uh it's it's not like uh, to discuss the problems of gender equality that uh, one should only have old men or even young men it's uh, there have to be representations men. yeah or middle aged thank you <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah i know i i'm i'm i'm, I'm, I'm very open to ex expanding no. this podcast if uh, someone if if women out there know about or are call. interested in the field um drop us a, a note absolutely exactly all right okay speaking of antarctic so, research yes and i mentioned also before this uh with the endurance and uh yeah let's uh let's see where the they endurance are is the still out there endurance 22 they're still looking endurance for it. Endurance 22 they are still looking for it and uh, if we go on the Endurance 22 um, site, so we can see the live vessel position that the Agulhas 2 is in the Weddell Sea in the uh, position where uh, more or less the Endurance sank. So they are there. They are moving uh, slowly in the ice. The site uh, is not totally updated in the news section with the, with the last days. Uh, the last uh, blog uh, or log uh, um, is uh, from before they hit the ice. They had a few storms, so now they are now they are practically in the position where the uh, the po reported position of where the endurance was, or where they think that they have to start with the job. Where it's assumed the in endurance where is, they don't really know are. it yet. Exactly, and this is uh, this is quite uh, quite something. And uh, if we uh, look for information about this, the BBC reports that uh, there is some research about uh, exactly how to estimate the error in the position reported we, by Worsley. We did talk about this on the last episodes where it wasn't really clear uh, because of the, the, the clocks not being synchronized well and that kind of stuff. Exactly. And and, and this is uh, reporting on the same article that I had read that is uh, a uh, that is uh, looking at the, the um, that is looking at the possibilities of error in the position reported by Worsley. Uh, so this is work by uh, scientists uh, Bergman and uh, Stewart, or researchers Bergman and Stewart, and they have looked at uh, um, the both at the at the way navigation was done at the time, the way navigation was done by Worsley, so the position, the determination of position by Worsley, what kind of methods did he use, what kind of instruments did he have, because a lot of it is actually retrieved. And so we know exactly what chronometer was used. They had a few dozens chronometers on board the Endurance and they were kept uh, like under conditions. They were um like similar conditions they were all wound up at the same time of the day so like there are there are several things that are quite interesting but uh, but we also have the the navigation on notebook of worsley so we have the notes that he took and uh, and the calculations that he did and 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 we know what materials he, he used so these uh, bergman and stewart they have looked at these and they have seen that Worsley, because they have been away from uh, like a, a clock, a standard clock uh, on a on a position on a fixed position, um, they for a long time they had um, they had to update or estimate the error of their chronometer. Um, and and one of the methods to estimate the error, so the drift in the chronometer, is by looking looking at occultations of celestial bodies. So, for example, like when a star goes behind the moon, mm -hmm. and and these are tabulated, 
so they are in the um, in the ephemerides, so in the nautical almanac. So these and, these uh, are these are tabulated up front because you kind of know where they are gonna move. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the uh, the the sun and the moon and the and the and the stars the apparent the apparent movement you know <laughs> I'm I'm looking like when you're looking at uh, at an astro navigations you're looking at a very geocentric view of uh, of the of the sky. Yes, you are. I would say the, <laughs> The, the apparent movement of the sun is not constant or the same with the moon even more so there is something called the equation of time so the sun at some moment seems to go a little bit faster a little bit slower in the sky so this is uh, this is something that it can be estimated it's relatively regular so you can do it for a few years in advance and tabulate it tabulate the position of the sun in the sky at every minute or at least the position above Greenwich, what kind of uh, in the meridian of, of Greenwich. Now the uh, the tables that Worsley had apparently have miscalculated or had an error that place the chronometer about twenty seconds fast. I think so. His chronometer was w what he thought that it was the corrected time was actually off by about 20 seconds and and, and, and 20 means, seconds if you're working with a sextant is 20 seconds a significant error does that it's a significant that's quite significant it really depends on where in the globe you are if you're closer to the equator or closer to the pole but the yeah. more you go closer to the pole the more sensitive it is to to this mm -hmm. plus that to determine the latitude it's nice or it's easier to take the height of the sun over the horizon around the local noon and you don't need a chronometer for that you just say how high the sky the, the sun is in the sky and you take that angle more or less you take that angle you subtract it from 90 and then 90 degrees and then you have the the uh, the latitude um for the longitude then you need the chronometer and you can be like in this case you can be several miles east of where you thought you were because you thought that you were further on i mean 20 seconds you I mean you you were 20 seconds too fast so the sun had been placing you a little bit too close to the west and um so there is uh, this is this is just about the position that worsley had and the, the correction of chronometers the uh the other uh interesting thing to think about is that well the ice was drifting and maybe it released i mean they know when the endurance started going down but did it, did she go down all the way immediately it's we are three thousand meter deep and what kind of currents are there were there and are there down there and and where did she drift while going down i mean it's also that uh uh, a ship is not shaped like a rock, so it doesn't go directly down. It will probably like drift in it's a more like particular a, direction. Depending like if you drop a feather pointing. or something, it will do weird yeah. motions when it moves down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, so it's really interesting. This. Um, so we have uh, uh, speculations, or actually calculations, in this case by Bergman and Stewart about where the endurance, where, where the ground position or the surface position of the sinking actually is based on the position reported by Worsley and on what we know about navigation and what he was doing and all the all his all his logbooks and uh, and now we'll see i mean i think that we will we'll probably come back to this at least once either by saying they have found it <laughs> their founder or by uh, saying that they are trying again once more so hopefully uh, Hopefully, uh, we'll have a we'll have some some news soon. Uh, so they were they, saying they're only going to stay about a month in the in the ice. So 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 they they're doing um, the search using I would assume sonar ground scanning yeah. uh, 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 methods and and probably UAVs, and right? Yeah, yeah, re uh, remote. Uh, um, submarines like ROVs. Uh, for, is that for, is um, that something that you? I mean, how how just in general, how big of an area would you be able to patrol by a UAV? Because you don't have much visibility down there, do you? Well, the uh, there is not a lot of visibility, but of course, you uh, the the problem with these is that these uh, UAVs are tethered 
to the ship. Mm, okay. So they are tethered to a to a to a station on the surface, and uh, and this gives the possibility of controlling them and responding real time to the images that one has because transmission of data underwater is extremely difficult. Right. And on these distances, or three thousand meters deep, that's it takes a long not cable. Very. Yes. Yeah. There are. There are um, there are there is a long cable, but also there are possibilities of transmitting data underwater via, for example, light. But at this distance, light is not uh, an option. In sound, uh, it's even worse uh, down there. Especially, I mean, a sound modem would be uh, <laughs> would be at the speed the speed that we know from from the old days. Yes, <laughs> you know, like yes. uh, dialing through the uh, through a telephone lines. Um, so there is the. Uh, uh, Agulhas in the ice and drifting with the ice because, I mean, she can keep a position, but if the ice can also push her uh, much uh, faster than, than what she can uh, she can react. So so there are some con constraints on where the ship is and, and this long 3,000 meter more even cable to the, uh, to the ROV is, uh, is quite, a, quite a limitation. Do and you plus that visually, if one has to scan an area i mean the, the rov also has uh as like a scanner a sonar so they will probably not go down to the deep and scan visually but they will scan with the sonar from closer by so as to have a finer resolution and uh up there we are not they uh, autonomous uavs are not in in question right now are they the autonomous uav has some advantages of course that one is autonomous but also the disadvantage that the autonomy is limited in time so the range is not large oh, because then they'd have to be battery operated and it's cold out there yeah. and yes 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 yeah you can you can even have i mean first of all autonomous unmanned is a problem because you can't react to situations that might happen so you send something to go down. It's I mean, not like a Roomba. The definition of yeah, a Roomba. exactly, <laughs> a, a, a undersea yeah. Roomba that will um, yes. make its way across the seafloor and just sweep it and um, yeah. and bring back mowing... recordings. Come back for charging and bring back recordings. You know, but Roombas exactly. do that. So, they so come this, back and, and we charge. we have we have seen these like these uh, penguin shaped uh, yes. machines, but yes. they are made for the open ocean, not for going along the bottom of the ah, sea. Okay. So, so coming back to a docking station like a lawnmower, like an automatic lawnmower, requires a relatively well-known and, and flat surface. Now, nobody knows exactly how the bottom of the sea is, and there is actually the scarp, the ridge between the Antarctic Peninsula and the bottom of the Weddell Sea, so it's not a flat area. And uh, so it's, uh, it's, going to be, uh, it's going to be quite interesting here. But uh, I don't know exactly the size of the territory they are going to be able to do, uh, to survey. But it was a few square kilometers uh, two years ago when they tried last. And uh, I suppose they will not go enormously much longer, I mean, in a wider area this uh, this time. But there is more information on the site. Uh, Endurance 22, um, the Endurance 22 uh, uh, website. So uh, go over and have a look. And um, I encourage uh, like also following the news there uh, when they'll update them. Because of course it's uh, data directly from the ship and has to be updated uh, via satellite connection. And that is at endurance22.org and of course we are Going to link that in our show notes. Here's another one that um, I found interesting. There's, <laughs> there, we have competition. We have new competition. There's another Arctic podcast out there. Yes, and this is uh, you. You found this one. Here, did I find you? this? Yeah. Well, yeah someone, well, someone did. <laughs> yes, yeah, someone did. Um, the. Uh, Arctic Council has, uh, among uh, one of the organs, has the um, uh, the uh, Indigenous People Secretariat, and it's called IPS. And uh, uh, the Arctic Indigenous Youth uh, celebrates also the Arctic Council 25th anniversary this year. 
and has made a podcast with the conversations among indigenous elders and youth and uh, and um yeah so talking about uh, about issues that relate to being in the arctic and being indigenous peoples that is wonderful that that so sounds like they're creating an amazing time capsule there yes and uh, it will go on for uh, a few uh a few episodes because of course this is uh, for the 25th uh, anniversary which uh, oh so is, so is it uh, a time occasion. limited one or is it an ongoing but, uh, one like well, we do one here well yeah. i hope that they will keep on doing this i mean this is uh, my my colleagues next door because uh, oh, okay. we share the office uh, the office space and um and uh, i think that this is one of the neatest uh, Neatest uh, activities for the uh, for the anniversary celebrations. Wonderful, really, really nice. Yeah, and it is it's currently available on Spotify, and I hope they will open it up for other platforms because that would that would get them quite a bit more reach. I think. Yes. Very cool. Awesome. Fantastic. Okay, the next one. I found this one, and I was a. Um, mesmerized by it so there is um and it just just came onto my timeline i don't even know by accident and i saw yeah. these guys and they were uh at the uh, mcmurdo antarctic research station and there's this tube that sticks out of the ice and they look down there and then climb down there and i was very very intrigued by this and then you added some additional information there are mm under under ice observation tubes that you can or one i don't know how many there are but you can uh you can climb down and it's, it's a bit of a claustrophobic experience i would think <laughs> but um yeah. going down there you end up in a chamber that has windows into the world under the ice so you, you climb down there and we, we're watching this uh, on the video here right now <laughs> and then you come down and there's this observation bubble kind of thing down there yes isn't it amazing That's fantastic yeah it, it, it's it's really amazing now mcmurdo the station mcmurdo is on mcmurdo sound yeah. and uh, which is a uh, a branch of the ross sea so uh so we are here on the sea ice and this tube this observation tube it's a tube that just, just goes through from the surface down through the ice and looks what's under the ice so it's actually diving without diving and it's fantastic yeah. and you see for example uh, images i mean especially in the uh, youtube video um uh, that uh, that i i found here you can see a for example a, a a tube of ice that is formed when the uh, uh fresh water or the uh, the melting water is sinking down through the ice <laughs> and weird. is meeting <laughs> the very super cooled brine so it's it's the the uh frozen ice the, uh, column sticking the, out the, under a, the a frozen, ice a frozen ice column there and then uh, like uh, the uh, the video doesn't uh, really allow to see the life uh, around too much because uh, like it's the quality of the video is too is compressed bit, uh, unfortunately too yeah. compressed so the the voices behind they say oh we well, see all these fish and here and there but uh, for people that have never seen what the ice looks like from underneath this is a very good introduction and uh, if you are able to find uh, because there are several of these uh, videos but uh, McMurdo underwater observation uh, you can, if you search for that online you will find some some videos and in some of them you can hear even some whistling in the background and the whistling in the background now i do not know it's too little to understand what kind of seal might be but it is definitely a seal that is whistling this and i wonder i mean the ross seal uh, has the ross uh, seal which is a very special seal and um it might be that this this brings back memories because when you and I met on a ship, I remember you uh, bringing and that was that was in the Arctic and you brought out a hydrophone which um, like is, is an underwater microphone at a long cable and that was attached to a little recording device with a speaker and uh, you just lowered this down into the water and uh, and then we waited and shortly after we heard 
uh, this kind of sound and yeah, the bearded uh, seals, bearded seals. <laughs> and uh, Svalbard, yes, that was that was, that was yeah. th this this was one of those experiences that that was let me let me let me actually let me try to find this i think i can uh, you want to find that i yeah, can play it, something here yeah <laughs> but you remember that uh, we are discussing this and uh, and i was mentioning that uh, jacques cousteau's uh, first uh, very famous film the uh, monde du silence uh, the silent world uh, actually made gave this impression that underwater everything is quiet but it's not actually and we have been talking several episodes about underwater man made can sound. you hear this <laughs> Yeah, let's, let's, yeah. let's talk about the sounds here. The pumps. So you hear the generator, you hear the water moving rocks around. Yeah. Yes. And I'm, I'm going to forward a bit. There's your seal. And now the spiraling whistle of the bearded seal. It's taking out his territory, the males. I mean, this is just... Yeah, it's mind blowing. Do you hear this? And that's just one seal. Yeah. So this is this is this was mind blowing to me because that was the first time I heard it, and I heard it live, which was a completely different <laughs> story. And then I remember lying in the in the cabin at night and hearing the seal <laughs> and through. cursing me. <laughs> through the through the wall of the ship, um, and it yeah. sang to us for. Well, it doesn't sing; it communicates with other seals, I guess. It it tells them yeah, something. But it's, we can we can say it's a singing. It's a very melodious way of uh, so of communicating. So you yeah. can hear them in the video too, under the sea ice at McMurdo Station in Antarctica. Yes, isn't that brilliant? Exactly. And now talking about um, talking about really strange things. I mean, one of the uh, <laughs> One of the things that I got in my news feeds is uh, the discovery of uh, some really interesting, uh, they call it alien life here on the BBC. Um, <laughs> is it really it's alien? It's communities. It's, it's not really alien, but it's communities of sponges that live on extinct sea vents or volcanoes underwater volcanoes in the seafloor in the arctic so halfway between svalbard the north coast of svalbard and the uh, and the north pole on uh, <clears throat> on uh, the place of uh, a ridge so with a um with a um, how do you call it uh, like a volcanic origin so in in a place where there were underwater vents mm -hmm. and you know maybe that underwater vents can produce and can harbor communities of organisms that base their metabolism on the energy provided by the underwater vents so on uh, on sulfur and uh, instead of instead of oxygen as the oxidizing agent and uh, and and these sponges actually do not live of directly of the energy provided by the underwater vent but on the remains or the organisms that lived on these underwater vents so the vents can so, go away and then the the sponges yes. live of what's left over of the organisms who thrived on the underwater exactly vent. so the the underwater vent had a an ecosystem that was living on it and uh, and they went extinct when the underwater or they died off when the underwater vent uh, uh disappeared and uh, and the um and the dead material became foss fossilized <laughs> and uh, and this is where we have the sponges that with the help of the bacterial community uh, that is uh, that is living there are actually thriving on these and thriving is maybe maybe or an overstatement because <laughs> like they are probably they've been there for hundreds of years and they are not enormous in size but uh, they are uh, living in one of the most inhospitable places hmm. in the oceans yeah, and uh, if um, like uh, if one goes to the uh, nature climate nature communications uh, website and for this uh, this article, 
uh, nation communications yes uh, which is in uh, in open uh, open access i can see the details of the map where this um, ridge the langset ridge is and this is a, a ridge that continues the north atlantic uh, the mid-atlantic ridge so the one that passes th through iceland or like a, <laughs> like from south and north of iceland right where the atlantic north atlantic ocean opens and passes in the fram strait between uh, uh, svalbard and greenland and then bends over uh, eastwards in the uh, north of svalbard the uh, not really going to the North Pole. Uh, by the North Pole, we have the Lomonosov Ridge, but here we have the um, a series of ridges, and part of one is called the Langset Ridge. And we were talking about uh, between 500 and 2,000 meters of depth, so it's uh, quite a quite a, um, quite a depth, so no light. And uh, there are these uh, tubes that are living. Uh, these uh, these uh, fossil uh, worm tubes that are the uh, living matter on which the sponges actually uh, live and uh, so they are uh, they are amazing organisms sponges are filtering what's in the water uh, so uh, they are living off the bacteria that actually decompose the refractory organic matter that is this uh, these uh, these tubes from these old worms i find it amazing how life always seems to find a way it's just it's the places it's you find life is uh, really are really weird just weird <laughs> just wild they're not very colorful they are not uh, they are not particularly scenic they don't move <laughs> but they are but they are fantastic but they are there yeah. they exist it's they, a fantastic they idea yeah. and this is yeah. yeah exactly this is very amazing exactly even even in in these places all Even right, these very inhospitable places. So okay. I guess that brings us to the end of this episode, uh, an episode with women in science and uh, a search for a ship and a new podcast and, and under ice observation tubes and impossible life. I mean, that is uh, this, that, sounds, that sounds like a perfect episode, doesn't it? It's quite <laughs> a nice one. Thank you. Anyway, we'll be back. Hopefully in a week from now, everyone take care and thanks for being here. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.